welcome to the evening service of Emmanuel Baptist Church. We'll be singing song number 373, A Child of the King. And if you stand when you get there. <laughs> Bless us with the word. Yeah. It's good to see you all here this evening. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 1. Mark, chapter 1. My last year at college, I was in seminary. The Lord had kind of been laying it on my heart to do a study through the Gospels, and I was like, yeah, I, I should, I'll get to it, I'm really busy. And then I ended up with a class where we had to create a series going through the first half of the Book of Mark. And so it just sort of made it happen, you know, when you try to make excuses, the Lord, uh, if he wants you to do something, he'll make you do it. <laughs> so um, tonight, what we're going to have is an introduction to the gospel according to Mark. And um, have you ever just, have you ever encountered a, a group of friends who were trying to relate to you an experience that they all went through? They, they all, they tell you about this. So one person, he tells you about, about this and, and, and gets really into the details and is just going through the, the details and, 
and, and you really don't know where they're going, but they're really excited about all of the details of this story. And then you've got another friend who really can sum it up in just a few words. Uh, you know, they hit the main points and the highlights and, 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 and another, another friend who, who, you know, they've got a different way of telling the same story. And, and they hit different points, they hit different uh, details, they have a different way of relating it um, to relay what mattered to them most, what they want to convey with their story, even though it's all the same event. And, and we see that in the Gospels. We see, a, you know, a lot of similar things, but a lot of different things uh, between the different authors of the Gospels. And so when we come to Mark, it's kind of important to understand who, who Mark was and what was his goal in, in writing the Gospel the way he did. So we're going to touch on that a little bit today. Uh, so first off, who was Mark? From a youth, John Mark was intimately associated with the founders of Christianity. Uh, his mother owned a house in Jerusalem, uh, possibly where Jesus had his last supper uh, and where Peter came after his miraculous release from prison. Uh, John Mark, he, he may also have been the young man who fled when Jesus was arrested in the garden, so he may have known Jesus personally. He uh, was probably acquainted with all of the uh, disciples. Uh, he was intimately acquainted with several of the apostles. He accompanied his uncle Barnabas and the apostle Paul on their first missionary journey. Uh, and he continued to serve with Barnabas, his uncle, afterwards. Um, he and Paul had a little falling out because he didn't quite finish the first missionary journey. And Paul was like, well, I'm, I'm done with this quitter. Uh, but later on, Paul, uh, he, he makes mention of, of John Mark and his usefulness uh, and the, you know, shows us that, that Paul and Mark had uh, been reconciled later on. Um, he was a close friend and follower of the Apostle Peter and, according to church history, was probably Peter's scribe. And so a lot of these details, because John Mark probably did not have firsthand, you know, personal uh, 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 witness to all of the events that are recorded in Mark, but having been uh, a, a disciple of Peter and having been intimately acquainted with all of Peter's teachings and writings, a lot of the material that we get in the book of Mark probably came from the Apostle Peter. But Mark wasn't just uh, compiling Peter's recollections. Uh, he had a goal with the way he wrote the book of Mark. And we find in Mark a heavy emphasis on the actions of Jesus. Uh, you know, John, we, we see a, a very heavy emphasis on the, the words of Jesus, Jesus' teachings. Uh, but um, in Mark, we see a, a heavier emphasis on the actions of Jesus. And we, uh, they focus uh, around the th three confessions of Christ's identity. Uh, so they, and they are confessions of Christ's identity in relationship to his ministry at the time. And, and so, uh, Mark, he wrote his gospel about the time of the first official persecution, uh, by Rome in the wake of a fire that devastated Rome. Nero, uh, tried to shift the blame for the fire to that new countercultural Christian, uh, uh religious, uh, Jewish religious movement and uh, the Roman believers, they needed encouragement during this time because they had just gone through, uh, they were going through uh, heavy persecution. Uh, people were being executed. Uh, Nero was the one who ultimately executed uh, Paul, uh, according to church history. And, and so uh, there, there's a need for, um, for, the story of Christ, the suffering he endured, the betrayal that he experienced, and his prophecy of persecution, and uh, uh, all of uh, the, the calling of his followers to follow in his footsteps. Uh, we see all of these elements in Mark, and, and we see, so we see an emphasis on suffering, we see an emphasis on the actions of Jesus, and we see an emphasis on this, the discovering of who Jesus is by watching the things that Christ did. So um, 
So with the background of the author, Mark, and the sources that he had available, uh, the, the, uh, the timelessness of this great story still carries with us. Uh, so, but today we're going to go through and we're going to look at those three confessions, the three confessions of Jesus' identity. There's one right at the beginning of Mark, there's one in the middle, and there's one at the end. And they, they make for great um, pinpoints or, or, uh, of, of going through the book. And so to start our series, because we're going to go through the whole book of Mark, we're going um, to start with the first confession of Christ. Uh, we're going to look at the three confessions tonight uh, in preparation for our series. But the first great confession is found in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And hopefully you're already there, because I am there. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll start in verse 6. And John, this is John the Baptist, was clothed with camel's hair and girt of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I, than, uh, than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. Indeed, I have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the waters, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So right off the bat, first chapter in Mark, you're only uh, just over 10 verses in, and you, you're being told who Jesus is. Mark doesn't wait to tell you who Jesus is. Uh, we, uh, so just to give a little context for this portion of scripture, Old Testament prophecy foretold uh, uh, told of a forerunner to the Messiah, a voice crying in the wilderness. Uh, this voice in the wilderness would preach a message preparatory for the coming Messiah. And in Mark 1, we see that that voice was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was that uh, voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the Lord to come. And John, his message was that of re repentance in preparation for the forgiveness of sins. And, and we see right here in this passage, as he's going about preaching and baptizing people, Jesus comes to him, uh, to, to be baptized by John, to be identified with, to identify himself with John's ministry. And as Jesus, he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes down uh, uh, from, from heaven and, and lands on Christ. And, and we hear the voice of God declaring the identity of Jesus Christ. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus had the way prepared for him uh, by, uh, for his ministry by the message of John the Baptist, and he identified himself with John and his ministry, and he was announced to be the Son of God by God himself. Uh, but only those who had been prepared by the message of John uh, would have been ready to hear that, that announcement, uh, because, because nobody knows who Jesus is at this point. Nothing that he had done up to this point would have revealed to anybody his identity. But that would soon change. Uh, we, we see that after the outset of Jesus' ministry, he is identified as the Son of God by the Father himself. But how would other people understand this? You know, people who had heard John's message were, and were prepared by John's message for, for uh, someone who was coming after and they were looking for someone who was coming after, who would bring that forgiveness of sins. And, and Jesus shows up and it's announced that this is who this is. And, and they're ready to hear that. But not everybody is ready to hear that Jesus is the Son of God. So how would this happen? Well, until then, Jesus had been a nobody carpenter from Nazareth. Uh, but pretty soon there would be some who would come to their own conclusion about the identity of Christ without having to be told. Jesus began calling to himself disciples and he began to began his own preaching ministry in the area of Galilee. And as his ministry began to grow, John the Baptist's ministry began to fade away until it ceased. 
uh, with his arrest and eventual execution. But Jesus' ministry, however, it, it, uh, it begins to grow and thrive. And John had predicted that Jesus would be greater than him. And, and Jesus begins to do spectacular mi miracles uh, as part of his ministry. He showed his authority over the natural, the, the supernatural, and the moral forces through casting out demons, through miraculous he healings, and forgiving people of their sins. And this leads to the next confession of Jesus' identity by one of his disciples, Peter. In Mark chapter 8, and if you'll turn with me there, in Mark chapter 8, verse 29, we see that Jesus' disciples, those those people who are close to him realize his identity. So if we look in, uh, in chapter 8, starting in verse 27, And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Who do men say that I am? And they answered, Well, John the Baptist. But some say, Elias. And others, one of those prophets. And, and he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. But, and he charged them that, no, that they should tell no man of him. Jesus is, as Jesus' ministry is progressing, uh, and, and, those who, uh, and begins to increase, uh, so does the controversy over who he really is. Who is this guy wandering around, doing miracles, preaching really strange messages that we've never heard before? Uh, who is Jesus? For many, the man that, that, uh, that a man could be the son of God was a hard pill to swallow. And many of his followers and, and uh, witnesses of his miracles were not present to hear the, the voice of God declaring Jesus to be his son. Not everybody had been there with John the Baptist to hear that declaration. Um, and, and, um, so soon pe people were debating where he got his power from. In chapter 3, the Pharisees concluded that Jesus got his power from the devil himself. Uh, in chapter 6, Jesus returned to Nazareth to preach the gospel to his hometown, yet they wouldn't receive him. Uh, they, they wouldn't receive him as the son of God because they all grew up with him and could only see him as the carpenter's son. But in chapter 8, we find the second confession of Christ's identity. Jesus asks his disciples who people think he is. Who do you think I am? Uh, and his disciples tell him that, well, many of the crowd think that you're uh, reincarnated John the Baptist. <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, some people think you're probably Isaiah or one of them other prophets in the Bible. Uh, and, uh, but Jesus, he, he, uh, he gets them to, gets to the point and he says, who do you think I am? And Peter, he immediately speaks up for everyone by saying, thou art the Christ. Uh, Jesus' disciples believed that he was the son of God. So at, so at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the only way that we know that Jesus is the Son of God is because God himself had to tell us. Nothing that we saw would have told us that this is Jesus. But he identified himself with John the Baptist's ministry, uh, and he, he had the announcement of, of the Lord to tell everybody who he was. And, and so, uh, but, but as Jesus progresses his ministry, as people get to know him and see the things that he does, uh, people are coming to only one conclusion. Even people who were not there to begin with, they, they, there's only one person this could be. You got to be the Christ, the Son of God. But this, uh, so the aftermath, Jesus' I, Jesus' identity was a, a conflict for those who watched him from the outside. But for those who knew him, Jesus could be clearly seen as the Son of God. The miracles and ministries, the ministry that the disciples witnessed was a, enough to help them identify who Jesus really was. But it was not yet enough for the rest of the people to see the truth about Jesus being the Son of God. At Peter's confession, Jesus asked his disciples to not tell others his identity. 
says don't start spreading this around. It was, people weren't ready. If you, it, it wasn't the right moments to, to openly share Christ's identity. Uh, Jesus still wanted people to discover his identity for themselves. Uh, the time would come when, when the gospel would need to be spread. Uh, but for now, uh, Jesus is still letting his actions demonstrate who he is, rather than having to tell everybody who he is. But this leads us to, to the third uh, confession, the confession of the centurion. And if a centurion could get it, I'm sure the rest of the world could too. <laughs> But if you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, and we'll look at the last confession. After Jesus' conversation with his disciples about his identity, he began to prepare them for his coming death. He began to include in his messages a message of suffering, declaring that those who would follow him should be prepared to suffer. And he continued to warn his disciples of what would happen to him uh, uh, would, when he would make his final trip to Jerusalem for the Passover. When Jesus did enter Jerusalem, uh, the events that Jesus warned about began to unfold. Jesus was arrested and delivered to the chief priests who condemned him to death. And then he was handed to the Romans who tortured him and hung him on the cross. And that's where we reach our, our passage. There, if you'll look with me to verse 37, chapter 15. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. As the clouds darkened and the skies uh, uh, darkened and, and the temple veil was torn in two uh, at the last cry of Jesus' death, uh, the centurion, who was in charge of the execution, became overwhelmed at the scene. Uh, this guy was an experienced career officer. You know, he was in charge of a hundred men. A centurion usually worked his way up through the ranks. So he had seen the nitty gritty. He had probably been in some gory battles. He had probably, uh, uh, is, you know, uh, had been uh, over executions like this before. Now, this shouldn't have been anything new to him. But that this centurion, this uh, hardened man, uh, would have recognized at Jesus' death that truly this man must have been the Son of God was a, a very unique identification of who Jesus was. It wasn't just now that people were told, this is the Son of God. It wasn't just now that, that people who were close to him realized who he was. It was now that Christ's ministry was over and anybody could realize who Jesus was by looking at his ministry, by seeing his death on the cross and eventually his resurrection. When Jesus began his ministry, no one knew he was the son of God. Only those who had been prepared by the message of John the Baptist were ready to hear the voice from heaven declaring Jesus as the son of God. But as Jesus began his ministry, performed his miracles, those who were close to him, uh, began to understand who he was, but those who observed from a distance were still in conflict as to who is this man. But at his death, Jesus had accomplished his task, and the world could know now that this was the Son of God. Mark wrote his gospel to proclaim the identity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the implications of his ministry to the Roman world. Through his gospel, Mark goes through the progression of understanding that those who encountered him had gone through. And from his humble start and being baptized by John the Baptist, through his miraculous ministry, and finally at his glorious death and resurrection, Jesus was progressively revealed to people to be the Son of God. But what did this mean for Mark's audience, and what does that mean for us today? 
it's all nice and well that uh, that we have all this uh, written out for us, but how is this any more significant to us than another history of another person? Well, Jesus' life, ministry, death and resurrection, and his identity demonstrate that he is the authority over the world. He demonstrated his authority over the natural world, the spiritual world, the moral uh, world, and over individuals, over life, and over death. He demonstrated that he was God himself, and he has proven through his life, through his actions, uh, that he is the authority that we need in our lives. John the Baptist's message uh, was preparatory uh, for Jesus' ministry, and it taught that, that people needed to repent of their sins in preparation for the forgiveness that was coming. And, and the goal uh, of Jesus' life on earth was the death and resurrection on the cross to bring that forgiveness to the people of the world. And... and uh, Jesus came to the world to begin, bring God's forgiveness of sin. And his life evidenced who he was, and the death and resurrection accomplished his mission, and only the Son of God could have accomplished that mission. Only the perfect, eternal, uh, sinless sacrifice could have satisfied the penalty for sin, and Jesus was willing to be that sacrifice. And, and Jesus' life demonstrated who he was, all right, this is the person who's qualified for doing this. And then he went ahead and accomplished his goal. Christ's ministry demands a response. In the, if the very Son of God came to earth and, and preached a message and suffered in ignominy at the hands of his own creation, and certainly it is a fact that we can't just simply ignore. Jesus is the Son of God. He made himself known to all the world. And he suffered the penalty of sin for all the world. And his person and authority require a response. Jesus came to this earth to bring forgiveness for you. And we don't have the privilege to just look over that lightly. We need to look at that and look for that uh, forgiveness for ourselves. And so have you responded to the ministry of Christ? Have you accepted his offer of forgiveness uh, do you reverence him as your God and Savior? And if not, I would invite you this evening to, to accept that forgiveness that Christ offers you. However, if you're here and you've accepted Christ as your Savior, which I believe is most of you, uh, Christ's ministry didn't end there. It didn't end at the cross. didn't even end at the resurrection. Jesus gave that final great commission to all those who believed in him. That great commission to take the gospel uh, that he lived out with his life and to share it with those who don't know it. And if Christ is the Son of God, and if you admit that, then you have a responsibility to follow out that last command that he gave. To live out the things that he taught and to share them with others who don't know them. If Jesus is the Son of God to you, and you claim him as your Lord and Savior, have you been obeying him? Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to live that perfect life, to be the example, to demonstrate, not just tell us, but to demonstrate for us that he is who we believe him to be, the Son of God. And thank you, Lord, for the, the ministry that he accomplished and the goal that he had to uh, bring forgiveness of sins. Father, help us to honor you and to honor him and to recognize him as our Lord and our Savior and the implications that have for us to share the gospel with others. Pray that you would help us to be uh, conscientious of, of uh, what we have received and the commission that we've been given in Jesus' name.